Hey, this is Ashram All Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hints and tips of dentistry. You know, thank you so much for being here. I'm very grateful to all the viewers and subscribers that have been with me over the last really long time. And I wanted to share this case with you because it took a bit of planning. It took some time to get into this MB2. And it honestly, at one point was like, okay, we're uh, my initial sitting with the patient was like, wow, I don't think we're going to be able to find MB2. We'll have to approach this from a surgical standpoint. But we were able to get down it. And perhaps the reason, you know, because I got down it, I wanted to share it with you. But there's a whole bunch of information that we we looked for in advance, kind of little details in an effort to, well, if we get down it, that's great, MB2. But if we don't, then what's our option? I think that that's one of the, you know, at the end of the day, I want to talk about that. It's pretty quick. It's going to be apical surgery. But this patient's going on a trip and whether or not we're not going to do apical surgery right away, but we're going to be able to better talk with our treatment plan with the patient actually because of her comb beam and anyways without further ado let's go ahead and get into it but here mesiobuccal root you can see that here's our mesiobuccal 2 canal so what happens is in this software because it goes straight up and down like i can't angle the tooth you know what i mean like angle the tooth to any setting it's just literally up and down according to the these planes here so i kind of Unfortunately, that is a down, that's the downfall of the software. It's not really designed for endo, but it works just great. But this little thing right there gave me an idea. Let's blow that up that, yep. Well, there's two things here. So, and I've actually got another, a little secret that I learned the hard way. Stay tuned for that a little bit later about if you've got several portals of exit, a little trick that can really help you in getting your working length. So this little line right here. So this is our, let's go ahead. I'll just walk you through this. This is our buckle, buckle plate. Palatal, palatal plate, this is our maxillary sinus, this is MB1, and actually look at the width of this root. So it's fairly wide, and that alone just gives me a huge sneaky suspicion that usually there's, you know, there's going to be an MB2 most likely, and here's that MB2 canal. Now, so I know what it's like to feel alone deep down in a root canal and not know what to do, not to know any tips, you just try, you struggle, and then you give up, and confidence is lost. So I created a course that took all the things I've learned in residency and the thousands of cases I've done and the YouTube stuff, put it all together in a course at allthingsendo.ca. And as well, we put together a Facebook group and it's a private Facebook group that's linked to the course. You purchase a course, you get the code, you come into the private Facebook group and it's a safe place where you can post your questions, ask any, ask any questions about cases, instruments, anything. And what I love about it is that all the clinicians know it's a safe place where they can ask those questions and not be judged by others. So go ahead and check us out at allthingsendo.ca. And uh, I think you'll... So this is our access. We're going into the access. We're at the pulpal floor. So this, this is... Let's go ahead. This is our... This is the tooth number one five, one six, first molar, second molar. And now as we go up into the root you can see these little white lines this is where the calcium hydroxide is and look at the shape of this root so this is the mesiobuccal root if we compare that shape alone to our distal buckle there's our distal buccal root see how it's really hard to see and by i'm by no means an expert in this i've just used it a lot the shape of this root is fairly um kind of not ovoid but uh not circular. How about that? This mesiobuccal one, so this is mesiobuccal one, if this is the entire root, is not centered in the root. Now, if that was centered here and was centered all the way down to the tip of the root, it'd be like, oh, probably only one. But what happens is we get, it's really hard to see. This is at uh, taken at 100 voxels. It gets, you know, it's ones and zeros. It's hard to see in this setting. So unfortunately, in this axial slice, it's not super clear you know is that a portal of exit is that this is a canal is this a canal probably what i did was to kind of give myself some confidence when i'm looking for the root or looking for the canal in the root is to measure the width of the root so i've got 2.36 millimeters and i know that my munspurs and that's what i typically use i don't use a lot of ultrasonics just it's another thing for me to have around and break uh, my, the burr is either a half round or a one millimeter or a half millimeter. So I know that I've got some playroom here to look for MB2. And this number 2.36 actually played a significant, it played a significant role. And if you have the ability, you know, if you're looking for these really tiny canals, 
it's it might be really helpful for you to measure you know you I don't know what's what here but maybe you know this is the root here really measure kind of give you an idea where the measurements are in terms of the width of things relative to the instruments you're using because it might give you a little more confidence and it gave me a little bit of confidence in mine okay so just to remember here is our periodical radiograph We've seen that before and here's what the plan is to tackle mb2 so if this is our mesobuccal root, this is MB1, this is MB2, you know, it's pretty straightforward. We know most likely based on the shape of the root, and there's a little sneaky suspicion of a canal at the apical portion that there's an MB2. Now, the problem is, is that because of my software, and maybe just because the canal is so calcified, so there's that part, part. So the problem is, is that as I take this, so if this is our MB2, and this is the one section through our coronal slice, what do we? What am I trying to say? Just in case you you can't, if you don't, if it's not clear, it's that this slice right here is this, you know, is actually what the software is able to slice through and see where that canal is. There could be a, a totally patent canal. The problem is that I can't, as I slice through there, I can't. The individual slices don't actually get a full canal. Now, if the canal lines up, you know, if the canal were to line up with my slice, like if I could maneuver potentially my software to do something like this, you know, I might get a better, better slice and get a better view, but I can't. So what we're going to do to mitigate this issue, because I can see that, but I don't know if there's an actual canal, if it's like this, or is a canal like this. So what I'm going to do, you know, so it maybe it's just a branch off of MB1, which is totally possible. So what you're going to see me do is take a hand file, like eight number eights, and actually a secret, I use C plus files. I don't normally do that, but I kind of want to, you know, in case there was something ledging or something blocking this entrance, I wanted to make sure I had something with enough stiffness and rigidity to get down there. So I made little small bends to get down there and take my file and kind of sneak it down there. And if I was able to get a bite, then I'd watch one it down and go down there. Now, you'll, I'll let you know, cat out of the bag. I didn't need to do this. It didn't work. I was able to actually find the little, it was tiny though. And that's, which that's kind of wanted, what I wanted to share this with you is that using based on anatomy and all these other things that we plan for to try to get down it. And I wanted to spend this time with you because often, you know, you see, you see pictures real quick of, of MB2 is like, wow, it's amazing. But you don't really get to see kind of all the background work that gets involved. Okay, so let's dive into this beast. So let's just, we'll set the, uh, let's give you some coordinates here. This is the, the buccal cusps, palatal cusp, mesial root, or mesial, <laughs> mesial marginal ridge, distal marginal ridge, and you can see there's a composite, composite. This is the entrance into where MB2 was initially. And it's pretty much in line with one of the tricks that I learned many time, years ago in residency. If you draw a line from your mesial buccal, uh, mesial buccal one orifice to the pelatal orifice, and then a line bisecting that from your distal buccal somewhere around here or whatnot, you know, you typically aim around here. So here's uh, distal buccal, the distal buccal, here's our pelatal, uh, pelatal um, orifice. Let's go ahead. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use my long diamond just to kind of clean up that area. We want to try, you know, it's one thing to the priority of removal of, you know, when you're doing endodontics or decay removal and restorative, you know, you've restored a material you can remove existing curious dentin, and then finally tooth structure. But also you don't want to make your canal, your access so tiny, like those incredible endodontists all over the place on, on social media. Unfortunately, you know, the problem is they've been doing thousands of these and they can get into, you know, teeth that, you know, a mice can get in like a tiny, tiny little mouse could get into like into your house. The rest of us, you know, let's use a decent access to make sure we get access to everything. So let's go ahead. We can see we've got calcium hydroxide in our palatal canal. We've got calcium hydroxide in both distal buckles. So there's DB1, DB2. And I wish I had recorded it uh, when I initially sat down a long time ago, not in this setting, but the, at the, uh, when I, the, the other dentist needed me to take a look at MB2. We took a slow round burn and removed all the calcification along that portion there. And it unroofed that distal buckle too. So we're gonna rinse out with some sodium hypochlorite. Let's clean out that calcium hydroxide. All right, so what you're seeing here, this is a really stiff C plus file. I don't typically norm normally use these, but I'm trying to hook in. So I'm just trying to feel around. I've got a little hook on, a little bend on the end, and I'm just trying to feel, maybe there's another catch. Maybe MB2 is not in that spot here. Maybe it's just somewhere along there. 
Unfortunately, it wasn't. So I'm using that stiff file. Don't really use it. You gotta be really careful because it's got an active tip on it and it can cut. <laughs> so what you see here is, let's just take a look at this. You can see there's that, just like the, the keynote that I showed you, there's the, the hook on the file. I've turned that towards, the unidirectional stop is turned towards that so I can kind of get a sense where the file is in the canal. As you can see, what I'm doing is I'm just scooting that along the, the mesolingual side of that canal. And I'm just trying to feel to see if I get any bite or not. Now the working length is roughly around 16 mils. And you know I'm trying to feel for any type of catch. I get nothing, like literally nothing. So I'm gonna kind of whip through this, use my apex locator. So I don't get a catch, I'm kind of like, well, what should I do? So I'm gonna use another file. This is a C plus file, it's a little stiffer. I don't normally use these either, but in this case I wanted a stiffer file. And there's that hook, I'm gonna turn that hook towards MB2, try to skate it down the, the end of the route and see if I can get into some sort of canal that's maybe connecting MB1 and MB2. So I wanna give a shout out to my friends, Kevin and Zach, and this is them in action. They run a podcast, it's called The Very, Very Clinical Podcast, and really funny guys, the link is in the description box below. They, I, they sent me this link and uh, because they have all types of different speakers on it. And this one, they talk about Zach, this guy jumping into digital impressions. So go ahead and listen. <laughs> it's, you'll be entertained. Be really funny, guys. In the description box below, you'll have access to the Very Dental Facebook group. It's sort of a boutique-esque type of group. It's only for dentists. So go ahead and check them out there. I just want to shout out to these guys because they're some really funny, great uh, clinicians. But I can tell you that using not only the comb beam, but also high magnification and practicing extracted teeth. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, get yourself some extracted teeth and work like crazy on these because it will boost your confidence significantly. So at this point, I'm kind of like, well, I don't think there's anything. So I'm going to take a 15 file. I'm going to get working length on all of my canals. See how the cusps are flat? That's very helpful because your reference point will be stable every single time. So in terms of efficiency and tackling these cases, what we're gonna do is we're going to clean and shape. We have working length of all of our canals, the three main canals. So distal buckle, mesial buckle one, and palate. And what we're, sorry, we're off the screen here a bit, but what we're gonna do, and, and this is what you can do in your own practice, because it's easy to get, get really focused on trying to get down MB, MB2. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna, I know that I have working length on all of these. I need sodium hypochlorite to get down there either break down vital tissue if there's still some remaining or kill bacteria. So we're going to clean and shape and get those ready for obturation and let them sit and soak in sodium hypochlorite for the rest of pretty much the entire appointment. That way they're ready to go if we get MB2 and they're ready to go if we don't get MB2. That way we're not wasting time. Clean out the, the main canals and then let's tackle MB2. So what we're using is a slow round burr months. This is the, the purple. And what I'm looking for, I'm looking for little dots. And I've got one right there. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's it. Sweet, right? So I'm just going nice and slow. In the back of my mind, I know that this is roughly the area where MB2 normally is. So you can see that white dot right there. I'm like, well, that's a dead giveaway. So what's happening is that debris is getting caught into that orifice. And then we're set. But then when I go to take my file and try to put it in there, so what I'm doing again is I've got a small bend on the apical portion of my file, it won't go. So what I'm gonna do again is maybe there's some debris in the way. So I'll get some liquid, maybe I'll use some sort of a chloride to get some irrigant down there. And then what I'll do is the same thing. I'm trying to get that file to go into that little little spot. So that if that's an orifice filled with debris, it's, you know, there's a little, like a little divot, a little divot there. I should be able to get that file in there, but it wouldn't go. I'm like, okay, well, fair enough. So I struggle with that for a little bit with that little file, I'm just trying to get it in there. And I'm using short 21 millimeter files. It's really hard to tackle this stuff with, with the regular, or if you're doing it with 31 millimeter, oof, good luck. And then sometimes what I do, so these are short and the way, the reason why I know that, well, I just did this case, but the reason why I also know is that the brand we use, I'm not paid by anybody, but they're called Lexicon. They have white stoppers for 21 millimeter files. And then the 25s actually have yellow mm -hmm. and the, the 31 millimeters have black. So I instantly, if I see them on the sponge, I know what size we have. It's actually really helpful. But is it worth paying for that? I don't know. So I'm still trying to tackle that. So now I've got, this is a C plus file. Now, if you compare what I'm, I've got a stronger tip on there, a little stiffer file, and I'm just trying to put pressure 
I'm trying to use this file with a little bend to try to get into where that, if you remember that little white dot, but I got a no-go. So I'm kind of like, hmm, try, struggle, same thing. I'm not going to drag you through this, but you can see we're trying to get it in there and it just won't go. And I'm trying all types of little angles and little bends. And it's a lot of it's by tactile sense because it's hard to get a mirror in there and your cucumbers at the same time. So I'm like, okay, maybe an eight isn't stiff enough. Let's try a number 10 C plus file. Again, active tip. I'm just trying to weasel it in there. Normally I'll use cotton forceps, uh, but at this point I'm just trying to use just my fingers to get a little bit more pressure in there. And the reason why I wanted to include this, so I, I'm very grateful you're watching this, is because you know these are some of the things that you can't, you can't finesse this out of a two minute video. It's really hard to watch somebody struggle in two minutes because I wanted to show you the 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 outcome of this. So. I'm using my half round and I'm still getting that dot. And I'm like, what is going on here? Does It's not going away. So I'm just lightly brushing. And you know, the question you may have is, how do you know you're not gonna perf into the frication? Well, what I'm doing is I'm actually doing two things. I'm tracking dark. So I know that I'm going into the root. And remember that 2.63 millimeters, I, that's in the back of my mind. So I know that I've got some wiggle room to tackle this. So I see two white dots. There's a white dot. I know it's not focused. I'm sorry. This is focused. That's not, there's a white dot and there's a white dot. So in the back of my mind, I'm kind of like, let's see if I should be using an endo explorer. Maybe. Yeah. So I'll grab my endo explorer. I'll put pressure on one and then it kind of disappears. And if you, you know, let me know in the comments below, if you know exactly what I'm talking about, when you put pressure on one of these white dots in root material and it disappears like, ah, so MB2 normally, it's normal course actually courses mesially and then apically. I'm trying to tackle it right around here because that's its normal course. So I'm using still the number, the half round burr. This might have actually been, I don't like ultrasonics at all because it's another machine I have to grab out, but it might, ultrasonics might have been actually been very useful in this case. <laughs> And there's still, let's see here, still, you can see that hook. So I'm just, watch that fob, just trying to sneak it into anything. There's that white dot again. You know, here comes the Endo Explorer. I poke away and then it disappears again. I'm like, oh gosh. So we're poking, trying to get a stick. You know, if you do Endo, you know what I'm talking about. Trying to get a stick in anything. And sometimes when you stick into root material, it actually, it holds it. You know, kind of like, ah, oh, that's it. And then you take a file and there's like nothing. So what I'm going to do next actually is called the, I forgot that I did this. I'm going to do what's called the champagne bubble test. I rarely use this technique. What it is, I'm going to place sodium hypochlorite into the canal. What I'm looking for are little bubbles of organic debris that's being broken down by the sodium hypochlorite. And so I'm using full strength sodium hypochlorite and you can see it's not very clear, but there is actually some activity going on there. And I'm kind of like, well, I find that during endodontic therapy, if if I'm stuck on something and it's not going well, what I'll do is I'll switch up to give myself a little confidence boost. So how can I boost my confidence and progress this case forward? So when we get to the get to, you know, the the one hour marker, we can obturate while I can clean and shape the rest of the canal. So that's what I'm gonna do. Oh yeah. So I put this in the video because this is one of our proxy indicators to know when to stop cleaning and shaping your your canals. Now go ahead and put in the comments below if you do this. What I'm looking for is debris on the apical portion of my flutes. That's kind of you know the mental game where I'm kind of like okay I need I need to take a mental break let's clean and shape all these other things to keep the keep the case progressing so here you can see I'm stopping I've got apical de debris in the apical flutes I'm like yep I'm gonna stop there what does that mean well it really just means that you're machining the inside of that canal to an adequate all the well walls are scraped and we're decreasing biofilm and getting rid of any of that the vital tissue. That's all it is. You know, you don't have to do that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to do our best job possible. And my experience has been to do the best job possible is to open up that apical portion to a size where you get debris on your apical flutes. And then you can be much more confident, you know, when you seal the case up, you show an x-ray like, yep, I machined it. I got an apical stop. I machined it to a certain size. I'm happy with that. You know, a lot of what we do, machining, what I was taught and trained, and I still believe today, machining is the path to getting irrigant down there. Whether it's full strength, half strength, doesn't really matter, but it's just getting irrigant down there to disinfect and break down vital tissue. So you got to use a lot of irrigant, lots. Okay, so this is the, it's a gray band, so it's a lot smaller. And yes, there was a risk of perfing, actually. See that little white dot? So I'm kind of like, well, it 
you know, I thought it was for my Explorer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the side of the round burr and I'm actually going to put lateral pressure on there. Cat out of the bag, this is MB2 right there. It's in the totally wrong position that I'm used to. No wonder why my file would not go down it. So what I'm going to do, I'm thinking like, I'm going to laterally move, laterally move the burr to that and open it up so I can get apical coronal, so like top down access into it, rather than trying to go in from the side with a file, which is not working. The pressure I'm putting on here is lateral, not apical. So when I'm doing that, I'm like, I can't believe this. It's actually staying, the little white dot is staying. The burr's moving very slow, I think like four to 9,000 RPM, something like that. And it's kind of staying and I'm driving it, I'm kind of going apically with it. And I was like, wow, this might actually be it there. So that's it right there. So that's MB2. And what I was really shocked about it, it was that I overshot with my normal access. So what had happened was it traversed down. And I guess during my initial, when I was playing around with it initially, it, it made some sort of weird turn and I wasn't able to get my file down there like at the first sitting before this appointment. This is a C plus file. I didn't need to use that. I took a C plus file, weaseled it in there. I'm just doing this really slow with cotton forceps, weaseled it in there, in there, round two, and then it's stuck. It didn't move. See how it's just sitting there by itself? I'm like, oh, I'm gonna watch wind that down, watch wind pull, let's see. Watch wind, watch wind pull, watch wind, watch wind pull. Just a hair, like you don't even see my thumb move. Sorry, you see my fingers. Watch wind, watch wind pull, and I'm like, boom, we're in. Like, I was shocked. So this is not really the file to be doing a lot of watch winding with because it's very, my experience has been it's fairly brittle. So it's great to get into something, it was not necessary for this. Don't I would not recommend you going and buying a whole bunch of C plus files because I use them very infrequently, extremely infrequently. That's MB2 right there. What are we gonna use next? I can't remember. Okay, we're gonna use a six file. Place it in there. We're gonna watch one that down, watch one pull, watch one pull. So I'm just gonna go through a regular six, eight, ten progression. So I mean from here on, I was very fortunate because it's actually a straight canal. The working length was really short. So one of the tips that I've learned the hard way because I did have a, a, a mild sodium hypochlorite accident when I had a really hard time getting a working length on a a root, a, pal a mesial buccal root that was in right in the sinus. So I couldn't get a reading on my apex locator. So I made the wrong assessment to cut my MB2 canal the same length as my MB1. And I knew that there were several portals of exit. Well, it turns out just based on biology of the root is that MB2, if it's got its own separate portal of exit, it's gonna be shorter and typically up to a millimeter just because of the way it kind of slopes down the root. And that is one of the tips that if you have a portal of exit and you're having a hard time, a separate portal of exit and you're having a hard time getting a working line, just assume at the beginning it's a millimeter shorter. And that's what I did here. It was 14 mils. And the final working length of the other canals was actually 15. 15 mils. You know, I didn't want to, didn't want to break any instruments. So I'm actually gonna open this up to a 15 file. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna do a quick balance force technique. It's not that effective. Actually, it's not even that useless, useful for 15 files. I really use them for larger files. Um, it was created by Jim Rohn in the 80s. So what I did here was I just used a small because I know it's close to the sinus as well. And that's the other tip that I wanna talk about from the comb beam is that if you lose your working length, you may be injecting sodium epicoid right into the sinus. So I'm gonna keep this a millimeter short 100% from one red bar, which is a PDL. So I'm gonna make sure I am not gonna have any sinus issues with sodium hypochlorite. And then we're going to use a primary, same thing. So I'm looking for debris. Am I getting cutting at the apical portion? Yes, so I'm good with that. So I'll run it and then we're gonna clean and shape and then we're gonna run through our disinfectant protocol. You know, I'm gonna use my Eddy. I love this thing. And then we'll run EDTA through all the canals. What I do is I'll talk about a disinfection protocol real quick. I'm going to use, it's pretty standard, just like everybody else, EDTA, sodium hypochlorite. But one of the things that they don't, people might not mention is that you can use EDTA to really get really close to your working length with your irrigating syringe and then irrigate all that debris out of there, you know, because it's really hard to get it. I'm chicken to get my, my, uh, irrigating syringe all the way down to my working length and be worried about a sodium hypochlorite accident. I don't, uh, you know, I'll use negative pressure um, irrigation sometimes. You'll see that in our course. If you go ahead and take a look at our course, I'm not going to clean and sh I'm not going to dry my canals uh, before I try out my working, my gutter percha points because I may have to go back in and clean and shape. Why am I cleaning and shaping? Well, because, well, why is my gutter percha not going all the way down to the end, down to my working length? Well, debris may have fallen down when I was irrigating 
and packed at the apical portion. I've had that happen. You know, that's a fairly routine thing. So what I'll do is I'll make sure, you know, I'm not going to waste any time cleaning and drying with paper points until I've fitted all my, my gutta percha points. When I first got trained uh, in residency, I remember they were talking about uh, um, tug back and using irrigant as uh, uh, to, to simulate irrigant to simulate the lubri lubricity, lubricity, lubriosity, whatever the, lu the lubricity, <laughs> the lubricant motion of the sealer to prevent, you know, to make sure you have tug back. But I've gone away from tug back and I love it because my buddy Les really talked about and uh, Dominico Ricucci talks about an apical, apical stop, and I love it. I've used it ever since for a decade now, and I don't worry about tug back. I, will, I just want to make sure I've got an apical stop so that gutta percha point does not keep sailing out the end, and we're set. So that's why I used to try in points with, C, with uh, irrigant, but now I just try in points because it's part of the efficiency and the flow that I don't dry my canals just like here, and then I fit my gutta percha, and I'm like, oh, damn it. I have to, my gutter perch is not going the way down. MB2, you can see that. So I think where I was aiming for, normal aiming was going over here, kind of making, you know, going horizontal, but I actually kind of overshot, I think, in prepping that canal. So there's a better photo of it. So there's our two distal buckle canals they join. There's our pallet. It's a large, wide pallet. And then what we're going to do is we're going to place sealer. So when I place my sealer, I'm going to place it with actually what we have been doing. If you're, I really, I'm super grateful you made it to this point in the video. I mean, this is a hell of a long video, but I really wanted to talk about kind of the details of this. Um, we actually started sterilizing these BC sealer tips. I'm a huge advocate listening to Dr. Patel, Shannon Patel from the UK. Shout out to him. Uh, during the AEE, uh, he talked about kind of his outcomes in vital cases and they were 10% less. In vital cases, over over a year, I think he was tracking them, and he thought maybe you know it was maybe from his gloves, changing gloves. You know, I've heard lots of things about BC sealer being antibacterial. We've read about antibacterialness of it. You know, I'm kind of like just trying to prevent any bacteria from going down there. And one way I can do that, simplify. I don't know makes a difference, but if we started sterilizing those tips and they don't melt, so you know, take it for what it's worth. I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but it kind of makes me a little bit happier. So, because, you know, the essentially what happens with those BC sealer tips, they end up in a drawer. You know what I'm talking about. They end up in the endo cabinet drawer, the little ugly cabinet that rolls around. So what we do is we put them individualized in bags, sterilize them, and that just gives me a little more peace of mind. So what I was doing there was I was popping, we inject into the coronal portion of the canals. I take a 10 file break the air bubble, break the, you know, there's an air bubble underneath that. So I break it. And then I coat the walls and then I coat a little bit, put a little bit of sealer on my gutta percha points. I'm not looking for tug back. I'm looking for apical stop so it doesn't go apically. And I've put, you can see I've really pinched off, see that little pinch on my gutta percha. So I know I put it right down to length. Put a couple, couple gutta percha points into the palatal canal because it's large. We'll take a radiograph. <laughs> and a sear. Now, we're going to sear that off. Well, that was really fast. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, we've I've just used some pluggers, just kind of seared off the uh, the top, the coronal portion. And then, oh yes, I had a, <laughs> I had a, there's my distal buckle canal, the second piece, the little gutta percha came flying out. So yeah, it happens. We're going to sear that back in. And our gutta percha points are all soaked in alcohol. Uh, actually, sodium hypochlorite, they're soaked and then rinsed, or not rinsed, they're wiped off and uh, just to disinfect them. So I'm just making everything look uh, really pretty here. So there's our MB2, it's not really in focus. Distal buckles, palette, and then our MB1. I'm super grateful you made it to this point. You know, put any questions or comments below. Hopefully this is helpful. Patience is helpful, but I think a plan of action in advance is really helpful. And also, I hate to say this, but magnification, magnification, magnification. Practice on extracted teeth. Anyways, again, I'm so, I, I'm so grateful you're here. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.